Hi guys, we're back with On Call with Insignia and are returning to our conversation with Leon Yip from Core 2 of Insignia Ventures Academy's DC Accelerator, back to our series Academy Afterthoughts. And if you tuned into our last episode, Leon did talk about his whole experience coming from the Singapore Civil Defense Force, then coming into Insignia Ventures Academy, his whole experience there, why he joined, some of the highlights, some of the, the more impactful moments. And now we're going more into his life post-accelerator, his venture into deep tech, specifically around the public safety and security space. So I wanted to kick things off there. Now that you've, as you mentioned in our last conversation, really had a mindset shift, thinking about innovation, how did that impact the next career moves that you made? To kick that off, it's good to explain what Hatch does to contextualize the work that I actually face day to day now. So what Hatch is that we look for startups with innovative technologies that could be potentially applied into public safety and security. So these are not necessarily startups that are already delivering uh, public safety and security solutions. In, in fact, we want to look at different sectors like the healthcare sectors, logistics, real estate, agriculture, space mm. tech, different verticals across and see what are the best emerging ideas from these verticals. How can it benefit our you know, emergency response agencies or, yeah. or other operators like the police force, the firefighters, paramedics? So I think that is the basic uh, premise of Hatch and within which I specifically uh, play a role in building community and communities in, in a couple of forms, right? So firstly, and the core of my work is to build end-user communities. So this is actually to find like-minded policemen, firefighters, prison drug control officers, border control officers to actually come to Hatch as a center and want to learn about what startups can do to actually change and alleviate some of the challenges in their operating environment. Right. So I, I think this has made me quite excited about deep tech for public safety and security in a, mm. in a couple of ways. Right. Firstly, I think we, we can experience it, especially in, in, or at least in Singapore. I think a lot of people can resonate with having touch points with the home team. Right. From the moment that you enter Singapore, you cross the borders, the home team is there, right? With your passport checks, the biometric checks and all. Right. Anytime that you need to call the police or interact with the police, uh, hopefully nothing uh, ill has befallen you. But let's say you need to, uh, you find a wallet, you need to return it, right? Or let's say uh, you have, let's say you want to visit a relative or a friend who is currently in a prison facility, right? So all these are all touch points with the home team, right? And the challenges that the home team faces are increasingly complex and manpower is increasingly short. I think this is not unique to the home team, but I, I think uh, it's felt especially on the ground. You can see it um, very tangibly in terms of the very long lines uh, between Singapore and Malaysia when you want to cross the checkpoints. When you have really big uh, scale events, I think as we speak, the biggest scale event is none other than Taylor Swift's concert, right? So <laughs> as, there are as many we're recording, I think that yeah, it's on the second weekend. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So not just the Taylor Swift concert, but you know, other very big events of quite worldwide significance like the Trump-Kim summit that happened mm. a few years back, F1 races and all. All this adds to the vibrancy and the economy of Singapore, right? And the premise of why Singapore is recognized powerhouse in, in Southeast Asia is also to do in no small part to the safety and security that right. Singapore actually projects to its uh, population as well as the wider global audience so that Singapore is a good place because of the safety and security in terms of uh, safety of, of, the, of industries like the oil and gas industry. Singapore is actually quite robust, very much robust in, in ensuring the safety of the materials, the way that the different substances are being processed, etc, etc, right? But these are all very complex matters that needs constant evolution on our part to meet, make sure that the demands of safety and security are met. So I think in general, I, I wouldn't go into what specific deep tech yeah. can actually benefit us because the, the list is really unending. But I think in general, deep tech that's coming out of the different universities have the potential when harnessed and applied into our environment to help us solve different challenges that we face, be it at the checkpoints, be it in terms of uh, addressing emerging risks of uh, new drugs that appear from seemingly nowhere. I think these are uh, things that, we all, and of course, right now also another very big scourge, the prevalence of scams all over the place. Mm -hmm. I think these new forms of technology will help us actually alleviate a lot of challenges on the ground, increase uh, efficiency and uh, increase morale of our officers as well and confidence of the public in our home team's ability to actually keep the gears running. 
24 mm. 7, right? So I think that this is what excites me about deep tech. But I would also like to suggest that the public safety and security sector or the domain also has something that is of value to the deep tech community, right? And what I mentioned just now, we have a lot of challenges. And right, I think right. a lot of tech startups are looking for challenges to solve, yeah. looking for impactful challenges to solve. A lot of the tech companies, they have very cool technologies, but maybe they don't have the right challenge or, or, or the use case, right? They, are, they don't find a product market fit. I think what we offer at Hedge and we offer in the home team in Singapore in general is that operating environment, deep tech can be tested and in a very robust manner. So if your technologies are able to be deployed in our operating environment, I think that there is a high chance of success for it to be scaled into different adjacent sectors like maritime operations, logistics, transportation. So I think that public safety and security as a seed bit and a test bit for deep tech also has value to the deep tech community, which for which right. I'm very excited. You guys are essentially like a platform for the home team side, as you mentioned, yes. as well as the deep tech, the larger deep tech uh, ecosystem. Which I think, if you think about it, may not even be necessarily limited to Singapore. It could be innovation from anywhere in the region. It could be innovation from, exactly. from elsewhere in the globe, right? As long as there's some kind of tie-in or uh, use case, as you mentioned, where it could actually help ease the work, make things more efficient for, for the home team with a CDF. And I know you mentioned that there's like a whole variety of different use cases, but just to humor our audience. And I think you did mention yeah. some interesting examples with F1, Taylor Swift, like what are some of the innovations there that you think uh, it could be hypothetical at this point, or maybe you're, you're already engaging with, with some examples here, but maybe just an example for that kind of use case, I think would be interesting for sure. audience to, to hear. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, but first, I think what you mentioned just now, just to jump on that thought, uh, hatch is not about an egg or hatching or chicken. It's actually about being a gateway mm. for startups to explore public That safety meaning safety. of hatch, right? That's the meaning of hatch, yeah. So e even that meaning itself, you know, the word has multiple dual meanings, right? Yeah, Which is yeah. effective of the kind of dual use that we are looking for in technology. Also incubation of... of yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. You can really go on and on about <laughs> the word play there. But I, I thought that actually was a very apt name. And uh, when I heard that, oh, this new center is going to be called hatch, I was like, okay, this is the place I want to be. So use cases and technologies. Yes, I, I'm able to share a, a couple of them actually. So we run open innovation challenges quite regularly where we actually publish our statements for startups all over the world to apply and uh, submit our proposals for. We recently graduated our first batch of mm. startups, five startups, I think, of, of which I can share a couple of startups that I am quite interested or particularly excited about. I think the first one is a startup that was originally in the healthcare or medical space so they originally used the technology to scan for breast cancer. And I think the intent was actually to bring this technology to underserved uh, populations or segments that couldn't really have access, access to those, doctors, those tests, right? Um, right yeah. But I think likewise, we saw the base of the technology. Now, I'm not too technical in, in nature, so I'm not going to try to you know, dive deep into the technique of it. But I think that we saw the potential for the similar technology to be potentially deployed at our checkpoints mm. to also provide a safe way to scan travelers um, to ID whether or not they are carrying any dangerous items. With that kind of test, I think the vision in mind is to have us have systems where travelers wouldn't have to divest their coats, their backpacks, their laptops, and mm. will be able to just walk through maybe a corridor. And as you walk through, actually, it's like the corridor is sketching a picture of whether or not you are a potential threat or you are a safe traveler, right? Mm. So I think that this is actually one good illustration of the technologies that are coming into our center. Of course, it's all experimentation, right? And we, what we do is that we provide some price money for startups to do a POC. And the POC is done in conjunction with our Immigration and Checkpoint Authority colleagues, as well as our HTX, Science and Tech Experts, to provide design guidance and design partnership to shape the product development to make sure that it is fit for our operating environment from day one. Right. right so actually right. that's that formula and of how the technology is being developed or the POC, the proof of concept is being developed well with us through our program. If you guys want to learn more about the other, I guess the graduates of that first cohort and what else Hatch is working on, what what other startups are working with, uh, reach out to Leon. I'm gonna link yes, his please. LinkedIn. Uh, in the description so you guys can reach out and have a deeper conversation on that. But I am interested in that whole process of, because you're essentially giving them a go-to-market, right? Yes. Access to their first customer 
which is essentially the, the, the Singapore government, right? Specifically the, the home team. So what would your advice be for entrepreneurs, as you mentioned, maybe developing sort of technologies and thinking about different sectors that these technologies could apply to and maybe even considering public safety and security as a use case. Mm. How should they think about engaging with the government as, mm. as a customer? How should they think about scaling their solutions perhaps once, say, like a POC works with the government and thinking mm. about how else to how else to scale that solution and expand their, their market? Jumping straight into the last portion of what you just uh, mentioned, for me, the, the key thing is for startups to recognize their strengths and weaknesses of their technologies and to find the partnerships within the ecosystem that are necessary for them to actually go to market to serve a government agency. It, it not just be in the Singapore context, but I think many governments would find it very difficult to work directly with just one startup to deliver the full suite of solutions. So I think what might be more commonplace would be uh, for us to test the technologies and also and validate it and for the startups to also be introduced to our ecosystem of partners who are able to actually integrate the technologies into full suite solutions. And it is actually through these partnerships with other tech companies that their solutions can scale not just to the Singapore government if it's validated, but also potentially to their customers in other sectors around the world. Specifically to public safety and security, I, at least in Singapore, I think what we're trying to do at Hedge is to really break down the walls between these different home team units as well as the innovation ecosystem. Firefighting looks very similar in when it's conducted by the SCDF as when it is conducted by an oil and gas company who has an emergency response team or like say right. an airport with an emergency response team. So I think that policemen, firefighters... There is some replicability to the... Yes, to, to correct. Planning the solution yeah. so, so to this case, right? Yeah. yeah. There, there is some accessibility there and, and we are not that scary. I think uh, the guys <laughs> in uniform are not that scary. They come to us, come to our center, come to our events. We try to have as much outreach to the ecosystem as possible and put end users and startups in the same room. Hopefully in time to come, speak similar forms of the language. I think that there is, on, on both ends, both sides of the fence, there is an interesting coming together of end users being curious, mm. startups being more curious about the operating environment. I, I do think that it is something that we want to explore further and see how we can have that transfer of knowledge, transfer of context, right? Um, across both sides, right? So for us, for the end user side, it's for us to know what's new and great out there. For startups, it's perhaps what does your customer look like? What does your customer think like? What is uh, the fit of your technology to this solution? But not just one particular solution, but to this whole constituent of end users that you are looking to serve or looking mm -hmm. to potentially serve. Yeah. I think that is fundamental, that curiosity that we are trying to bring in to the home team or rather this public safety and security ecosystem here. And uh, in terms of scalability, I do think that the Singapore government is proactive in its different verticals uh, to take the lead and actually experiment with startups. Mm. Right? Uh, some might be a bit more gung-ho than others, but I think that across the board, there are efforts to actually bring in new technologies into the Singapore government and let the Singapore government kind of wave the flag of entrepreneurship in certain areas. I think the fintech sector is one that right. has really flourished, right? The, the uh, MAS and everything they're doing there, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Look at the fintech festival, Singapore fintech yeah. festival and how, how global it has gone. Other areas, you know, that uh, are also very much the beneficiary of uh, innovation activities from the government will be your uh, food sectors, food safety, mm. food security. Uh, there's the whole uh, 30 by 2030 movement Right. Uh, so I think that's just spurring a lot of innovation. Maritime is another very good example. I think Pier 71 is one of the pioneering government-related kind of accelerators that is championed by NUS as well. And they have very credible startup stories and, and, and collaborations with startups. So IMDA has their own open innovation platform. Right. So Singapore, as a public service, I think we can be very happy of how forward-looking quite a few of these agencies are. But yet, at the same time, we can't take it for granted. Mm. So I think entrepreneurs would have to be quite proactive in searching out these opportunities and reading the economic situations and what's top of mind for the leaders and tuning towards our, our requirements. Yeah, I, I've spoken in quite uh, specific general terms. If you want to go into more specifics, I'm always open for a chat. Once again, this conversation is really to just pique the interest of our audience and really pull the curtain a little bit on 
how startups can work with the Singapore government. And it, it is a lot more accessible than people think. And I think even if things, I think especially when you think about deep tech and government innovation use cases, the connotation there is that it can be a little bit slow moving, quite niche or still quite early. But I think there is momentum as, you, as you've clearly painted that picture of. There is momentum. There are initiatives across the board. And it's just really about finding the people that you can talk to like Leon over here. And so before we head into our rapid fire round, I, I also wanted to bring back this conversation to Insignia Ventures Academy. And you did talk about, I like what you mentioned about bringing these two groups, like the government side and, and also the startup side and have them being able to speak the same language. And I think that's really something that we want to cultivate through the program of the fellows being translators in some way, coming out of the program where, you know, and bringing that quote unquote, translation capability to their own work or career. I wanted to zoom in to what's one experience or one relationship or one working relationship that you had pre-IVA that has had the most impact on your career now at Hatch and, and HCX. During my time in SCDF before in Senior Ventures, I was speaking to a couple of entrepreneurs that were very intriguing personalities. They were very, they were really go-getters. They were very confident of themselves. They were very clear with what kind of problem space they wanted to be in and to solve. But they had a lot of different considerations like funding from investors and what would my investor think and things. And I couldn't really quite wrap my head around it at that point of time because I'm like, hey, what do you mean? No, we are a potential customer. So I had a very initial kind of mindset of if we are traditional contract getters, contract signers. But I think it was only after the IVA experience, right, that a lot of things that this founder was talking about made a lot of sense suddenly. And I think that he was a very, and, and after I, I managed to engage him meaningfully, having learned some of the concepts of, you know, equity and how the dilution of equity through different uh, funding rounds and what it means uh, for startups to actually find a product market fit. And I begin to be able to engage better. And now we are very good friends. And I go to him for like kind of scoop on the startup uh, ecosystem and also I, I think that this is one particular relationship that I, I had that really benefited me and had an impact on my career. I, I think, but I will also say that today, startups actually quite well received in SCDF and in the home team. Not just because of what Hatch is doing. In general, the, the sentiment is that startups are carriers of innovation. Mm. Right? And I think that is a recognition for today, I believe that a program like IVA would be very much more well-received for public servants to actually mm. be exposed to in a more mainstream systematic manner. So I'm very glad that juniors or, or other peers around me might, have, might actually be able to reap more immediate benefits from being a part of this program. But I think yeah. just a few years ago, the concept was still quite abstract. It's still quite academic and it shapes things like how to spread awareness. But I think now it's time to really be able to put things into practice. Since you've been part of the program, we've had a lot more public servants actually yes. join the program as well throughout the, the past course. And we welcome any, anyone that's tuning in right now who is in, in the public service and, and thinking about how to better leverage innovation as Leon has done with the SCDF to, to their own respective areas of work to, to maybe have a chat with our program lead in IVA and explore that opportunity. And moving on to our rapid fire corner now, so some, some quick fun questions to wrap our conversation up. First, what superpower of any one of your fellow team or cohort mates would you want to have? Well, I think their patience. Mm. Um, their patience, as much as their, their go-getters, I think that they have been really patient and really accepting that everyone is in different seasons of their career. Uh, I think there were, I, I'll be honest, there were some points of time where I was a, a little bit out of sync with the program, but they were patient with me. They got me back up to speed. They were never critical of me not being able to be there 24-7 on call with them. And yet, I think they're also accepting of my perspectives. So I, I think that their patience is a real superpower or their ability to have empathy for a fellow teammate like me is a real superpower. You were at the SCDF at that time as well, right? Uh, yes, while correct, you were taking correct. the program, right? right. Yes, so it must have been quite a juggling act. <laughs> uh, it, was, it, was, it is an intense program. I think it's very experiential. I certainly would uh, re recommend people to dive deep into it and, and really go in 100%. But I think also that there's realities of people's time and all. Mm. And that's why you have a team. Next question. If you were invited to produce a Netflix series, what would the title of the show be? This is something I've, I've thought of. Not, not so much a thought of 
in the context of this podcast, but more of a slogan, right? Which is yeah. what I what in my personal mission. So I think my personal mission, which I believe if all the producer the show would be reflected in the title, would be for life saving something along the lines of life saving making every making life saving everyone's business. Mm. Yeah. I, yeah. I think yeah. that it has many different layers of meaning to it. That, uh, can Especially the up. business. I like, I like that everyone. Yeah, yeah. That, 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 that's, that's a good, that, that could be a good title for a show. Looking back now, what is a skill? Could be a soft skill or hard skill you believe you should have learned back in your time as a student? I'm, I'm going to shoot myself in the foot for this, but I think having concision and clarity, not just in thinking, but also in, in articulating my thoughts. I, I speak in quite a, a long-winded, roundabout manner. I think that there's much that can still be improved, but I, and also I think there's really value, uh, like what I mentioned in, uh, my, uh, in the previous episode, people's time is precious. Having, being able to articulate and express your thoughts in the most clear way as possible. I think it's a skill that I, I really should have paid more attention to in my, in my university days that I'm actually consciously trying to do more of now. That's probably a skill that can be, especially if you, you've built up certain habits, <laughs> it, 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 it takes some time. If there's something that you could automate in your job just by wishing for it, what aspect of your role would that? I would think that it's a lot of the nitty gritty of event management. I, I don't know that there are automation tools out there. I just really haven't found the right ones that, that kind of meets my requirements. But I think if I were to automate things, it would just be like come up with a concept for an event or for a mixer and a way to curate my audience to bring together two different parts of the community together. And if I could just come up with a list and show up on a day, that would be great. But unfortunately, there's a lot of administrative work that goes behind planning and events to make the experience for the community a joyful one. And finally, if you could pick anyone alive or dead to be your 24-7 executive coach or mentor, who would it be? And what would you want to learn from them specifically? I actually have two. Mm, uh, I'm, I'm okay. greedy, right? So I, I have two from different spheres. So you mentioned coach, executive coach. So the first one will be Jurgen Klopp, the current mm. Liverpool manager. Right. Mm, I, I, and I know that I'm only speaking to a football loving fans here, <laughs> but I think that it can resonate that when Jurgen Klopp first took over Liverpool, I think Liverpool was in a bit of a slump, right? but he's really injected his energy, his passion, and his savviness to manage you know, his team around him. Right. So I, I think that there is no, pers- well, a very few other people that I would like to be have by my side to coach me or to nag at me or to you know, give me a, one of his uh, trademark big hugs for his players when they are successors, right? So I, I think that he, the impact that he has on team morale, team camaraderie is indelible. And I think that kind of coaching to be able to be the front, put on a strong front and keep yourself sane in the midst of business and craziness, I think that's very important. Another person that I feel is a good executive coach that I would like to have is Vince Gilligan, which mm. to those who might not be familiar, is the producer, the creator of the Breaking Bad series and oh, the Better Call yeah. Saul series. Mm-hmm. I think that television series is, is a very difficult business to be in, but yet he has built such a successful uh, franchise uh, and introduced different characters and managed different actors to actually deliver the show, right? So I think the common thing between both uh, Jurgen Klopp and Vince Gilligan is really their execution how they've taken ideas, made it and gotten the trust of their stakeholders and investors in a sense and really be able to execute to, I won't say flawless perfection because I think that there were ups and downs. There were there are sometimes that Liverpool's seasons that go, go high and low. There are some big Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul episodes that are more boring or, or more exciting than the other. Right? But I think overall, the execution was phenomenal and I would love to have 24-7 mentorship on how to execute better. The Vincent Gilligan Answer was uh, pretty interesting. Wasn't expecting that. And on that note, thanks so much, Leon, for coming on the show. Thank you. Really not your typical story that we've usually covered here on the show. And I think for a lot of folks out there who are just tuning in, regardless if, if you're a public servant or not, I think there's a lot to pick up here in terms of just the crux of it being that there's a lot of things happening in terms of innovation when it comes to both the government side and the deep tech side. And there's a lot of momentum there and, and a lot to be excited about. And it's thanks to people like Leon here. And we've also really thankful that he's come through cross paths through the program as well. So hopefully more, more of his peers or more of future generations of public servant leaders who are interested in innovation. We'll get to intersect with them as well in the future. But in the meantime, if you are interested in ha- having a deeper conversation with Leon on public safety, security, deep tech and all that, do reach out to him on LinkedIn. I'm sure he'd be more than happy to, to engage in that conversation with you. And yeah, once again, thanks for coming on the show, Leon. Thank you very much for having me. 
All right. Uh, thanks so much, Leon.